My name is Todd Chirazas, and I'm the founder and executive director of the AILA community. We've been around for seven years. We're a 501c3 nonprofit focused on accelerating innovation for social good. So on a regular basis for the last seven years, we've been convening people uh, through these types of talks, happy hours, hackathons, trainings, and so forth to really educate everybody about how AI impacts our personal and professional lives. Uh, our, one of our longest running events is actually this Responsible AI Symposium. The first time we did this was in June of uh, 2018 up in Pasadena, where we did a similar format where we had two panel discussions uh, on the topics around AI and ethics and biases and governance. And so uh, what a more uh, crazy year we're having where definitely AI is permeating across all industries, across all of our phones and everywhere. And uh, you actually even get to now play around with it in a very tangible way. And so tonight, we're really going to be having a great discussion around the AI alignment with human values and really how AI is going to be disrupting uh, and maybe improving, enhancing uh, our workforce, la our labor markets, and also our educational systems. And so we're really uh, honored to be here at LMU, Playa Vista's office, uh, uh, campus. And uh, I just wanted to quickly hand it off to, our, to Jody, uh, who's been generous enough to allow us to have our event here tonight. So give it for Jody. Thank you, Todd, and thank you all of you for being here. Um, we've been very thrilled to partner with AILA the past nine months on several events. Todd moves at the speed of light, and when he communicates with the AI community, people listen, and he's just been an incredible partner for us throughout the year, but also just through LA Tech Week last week. So I want to give a huge round of applause to Todd and AILA. <laughs> thank you. And just welcome to our home. This is Loyola Marymount University, Playa Vista campus. Raise your hand if you're an alumni, staff, faculty. Okay, we have a lot of new friends today. Welcome. We are 90,000 alumni strong around the world, 60,000 right here in Los Angeles, and 10,000 students on an annual basis. Our university is your university. We want to open it up and collaborate and create the world that we want to live in. So I will leave it at that. If you want to learn more about us, do a tour of our School of Film and TV on the other side of the building. See me at one of the breaks, but thank you and welcome. Amazing. Yeah, we just hosted over LA Tech Week here on Friday through Sunday, a generative AI virtual world hackathon with the theme of heroes and villains. We had about 180 participants. At the very end, we had 14 teams presenting and five winners, and it was just a marvelous to see exactly how creative people could be within a limited amount of time, like less than 48 hours, uh, what they could quickly build. Um, and so we'll be doing more hackathons too, and definitely more events here. And so thank you for LMU for being an amazing partner. Um, and then next up is um, Easy AI, uh, who's been an amazing partner for this whole year, helping us with all of our graphics and our live streaming and content. And so I'd love to uh, introduce you to the founder and CEO, Lawrence. Thank you. Is everybody ready? Woo! Man, you can't get more than that for a symposium. I'm sorry. That's a great energy. Well, I think many of you guys have met before here at Easy AI. We're really focused on training your own AI assistant. Um, AGI is not too far away. Let's be real here. Uh, anybody play with AutoGPT? Imagine taking AutoGPT and making a real assistant. Someone that monitors your emails, someone that takes your YouTube content, writes blogs on it, and all you got to do is give it an objective and it brings it back to you. I like to say ChatGPT and Google Bard is a lot like playing ping pong. If you don't talk to it, it doesn't talk to you back. With Easy AI, we're trying to give objectives and return information. So even the AI is possible for it to text you, to email you, to take chatbots, contact your customers. And we believe that when you think about the internet, right? Like internet showed up and then you had websites. Then you had iOS and Android, and then you had mobile apps. Well, now you have AI and now you have personalized assistants. So I think everybody from a year from now will have their own personalized assistant and we can all feel like executives together. So thank you guys. Amazing. Yeah, normally at one of our events, uh, we have uh, them listening in. Basically, it was a crazy idea to ask Lawrence, how can we start developing our own AI for, for AILA, where we had our own knowledge base, and based off the learnings from our, YouTube, from our videos, our recordings of all these events, how can we develop a queerable type system? Um, and so he's been amazing, allowing us to be his guinea pig uh, to uh, test out the, his new system. 
Um, next up, um, I know Javon's not here, but AE Studio has been a ridiculously amazing sponsor. All the food and catering and the drinks have been generously donated by them, so please give it to AE Studio. And Javon, I know you're uh, tuning in live, so thank you, sir. Um, all right, so today we are we're supposed to have uh, Senator Alex Padilla uh, arrive here t uh, in person, but unfortunately he wasn't able to make it, but he was generous enough to re record a video for us, and so uh, we're gonna play that opening remarks from, Al from the Senator, and then we'll get into our conversation. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla, and it's an honor to join all of you with AILA for your annual Responsible AI Symposium. If you're a part of AILA, then you know better than most that artificial intelligence is nothing new in America. The technology has helped power commercial and public goods and services for years. But today, we're gathered at a fascinating moment in history, a time of convergence of advances in various forms of AI, public interest and awareness of AI, and government officials' interest in engaging on this topic. We have a tremendous opportunity to meet this moment and incentivize innovations that help spur scientific and medical discoveries, enhance educational opportunities, and complement the skills of American workers. So I'm excited to explore how we can continue to facilitate positive AI innovations that benefit all of society. But like any new technology, we also have a collective responsibility to consider and address the harms and biases that stem from these new tools. Now, I believe governments have a special obligation to steer AI's development and use in the most beneficial direction. That can come via government investment in STEAM education and funding academic research so that it's not solely the private sector writing the rules or establishing the standards for the future of AI. And it can also happen by demonstrating the best practices for leveraging AI tools and how the government serves the public and stepping in with regulations as appropriate. We need the partnership of industry, academia, and other stakeholders to get this right. And we need a strong commitment to ensure there's greater inclusion and diversity in the development and application of new technologies so that all communities can reap the benefits of groundbreaking technology. Now, that's a tall task, but I know that with the help and leadership of groups like this, the future of AI is bright, and I look forward to joining you in this important work. Thank you. He touched on a lot of great points, and especially one of them is around the workforce development angle, and uh, I'm really proud that for AILA, we've uh, last year uh, did a pilot where we were doing scholarships to help teach underserved around AI and product management and leadership. And that program uh, was successful, about over 70% graduated. We learned a lot through that process. And now this year, we're actually starting another program uh, focusing on uh, educating, developing an AI literacy program in medicine uh, to support the community college that would be run within the community colleges here in Los Angeles. There's actually 19 of them, which is really amazing. Um, and to be able to support Providence Health Systems. And so we'll be uh, announcing more about that in the coming months. Um, but we're really happy that um, we're getting more involved with training um, community college students and the underserved here. Um, thank you. Um, without further ado, um, I'm really proud and honored to have a friend and uh, uh, someone that I met uh, during the pandemic on Clubhouse. I don't know who here ever used Clubhouse back then, right? And now who ever uses it again? You're right, none of us. But um, it was really amazing that during that time I met some really amazing people from around the world and there's only a handful of them actually were in Los Angeles and X was one of those amazing people. And so uh, we've been very proud that, you know, for the last couple of years when we finally got out of the, you know, um, uh, out of the pandemic um, and be able to meet in person, that um, we've been working together on different events and um, we are very honored to have her as our keynote speaker tonight. So without further ado, please give me a round warm welcome to X. How do I make it present on here? Ready when you are. Well, as we're getting ready to, to flip over a presentation, um, 
Let me just give you guys a little bit of background and context about myself. My name is X, yes, just the letter. Uh, for about the past decade of my life, I've been working across artificial intelligence in different domains for different companies. When I was in the military, I did military intelligence where I worked with very early computer vision applications. Then I went on to uh, a bunch of consultancies around the country before landing at Microsoft, where I became uh, a purveyor and an architect of what we like to call ambient intelligent applications, which is where you use blockchain, artificial intelligence, and IoT, or the Internet of Things, to make an environment fully responsive to humans without explicit input. And for the past four years of my life, I've been, I, where I just left uh, recently, uh, I just left Google, where I spent the past four years working on making sure that internally, across all of the company's products, services, features, research, as well as research projects, research that we funded for institutions outside of ourselves, that the, um, the AI that we built was built responsibly that it was built in order to serve humanity and not to harm it. So figuring out where in you know, applications or products were actively harming people, figuring out how to solve that. Sometimes it was a UX fix. Sometimes it was a design challenge. People didn't understand how the algorithm worked. Sometimes the problems required a novel computer science solution. So we'd have to tap into the researchers that we had to be like, hey, we've never seen this before. How do we actually fix it? Or we'd have to create new research teams, which I had the honor of doing while I was there. I created two of Google's research teams, one which was created called Muse, Media Understanding for Societal Exploration, where we use computer vision to understand who was represented in media and how often. Um, the second research team that I created was the Skin Tone Research Team. Is it going to work? <laughs> the Skin Tone Research Team at Google looked at how we made computer vision applications see everybody, from the lightest of folks in the world who suffer from conditions like albinism to some of the darkest skin folks in the world. Um, our research was pretty successful. We turned it on in the Pixel camera, which was really awesome. Uh, got a Super Bowl commercial out of it before leaving. Uh, and now I am the CEO of my own consulting firm called Malo Santo. We work with uh, Fortune 500 companies across the country to help them figure out how to implement uh, AI responsibly, starting with companies like L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, LVMH, to name a few. So, quick question, how are we doing with these slides? <laughs> There's a lot of, enough about me, let's talk about the AI. <laughs> All right. Oh, you know what, let's try. I have a feeling it's probably those USB things. Let's see. Can I like airplay it to it? I think it's coming. There we go. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Woo, shout out to the IT guy. <laughs> Thank you, Todd, for making that happen. So today, I want to have a conversation with all of you um, that I have found myself having a lot over the last five years about the role that artificial intelligence is playing in our society. Is it a superhero or is it a supervillain? Well, first, to frame this conversation, I want to talk to you about what artificial intelligence is. There are a number of technical definitions. There are a number of philosophical and ethical definitions. The one that I prefer to use to frame this conversation is that artificial intelligence is teaching machines how to think and act like humans. We are trying to make technology that can replicate human capabilities. And when you think about it, uh, there are a couple domains in which that happens, uh, or the type of AI that we have. Um, and I'll get into that in just a second. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is make machines that are more and more like us to do things that we don't want to do. There are three types of AI, generally speaking. The first is weak AI or narrow AI. Without getting into all the technical definitions, think of weak AI as artificial intelligence that can only do one thing. No matter how smart my Tesla gets, no matter how well-trained it gets to see every crooked street line in the city of Los Angeles, it is not going to learn on its own how to get up, come into my kitchen, and make me dinner. That's considered a form of narrow AI. Even though there's multiple types of artificial intelligence that go into it, it's not an AI that's going to learn how to do multiple things. Then you get into strong AI, which is called uh, general or super AI. Strong AI is what we're starting to see now with the advent of things like ChatGPT, where, hey, it can generate a workout plan for me, and it can become a language translator, and it can write poetry, and it can like, write the breakup text that I want to send to my, <laughs> the person I'm talking to right now, right? It can do more than one thing that normally would take more than one kind of algorithm in order to accomplish. 
Uh, the last type of AI is the one that we're all arguing about right now, uh, which is super AI, which is when you get into artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence. When you get into AI that can act and surpass human capabilities. So that's the Terminator stuff, that's the stuff of sci-fi movies. There's a lot of debate within the academic community right now as to whether or not we've already reached artificial general intelligence. Is chat GPT sentient? Does it already know and think at the level that humans do? Personally, I have my opinions. That's for something over a white claw after this. But just to give a kind of breakdown of those categorizations. So if we think about teaching machines how to think and act like humans, one easy way that I always love to explain to folks is that humans have five senses, right? We have hearing, sight, smell, touch, and taste. Well, computer science and AI tends to fall across five domains that are pretty similar. When you want to think about hearing, it's called natural language processing. There are a bunch of subdomains under natural language processing that I'm not going to bother you with today. You have like uh, text to speech, right? And speech to text. You have natural language understanding, natural language generation. There are a bunch of subdomains in there to be able to make a machine understand what we're saying. So teaching the machine how to hear and then teaching the machine how to respond to us so that we can hear it back. So natural language processing is generally the field in computer science that deals with hearing. Then you have computer vision, which obviously deals with sight. So that's your face ID, that is all those algorithms and filters that you have in Snapchat, that is any field or any domain that deals with being able to teach a machine how to see the environment around it using cameras, sensors, LiDAR radars, etc. Now, unfortunately for us, there's tons of research in these spaces, whether it's taste, smell, and touch, but they do not have independent fancy domain names just yet. There's been a lot of pretty dope breakthrough research in terms of touch in the field of robotics, where they're doing things like building artificial skin and sensors that are more responsive than human skin sensors actually are. There's some really interesting stuff going on in the olfactory space, where they're creating like AI that can like smell and determine if something smells good, although I'm wondering who's the one saying it smells good or not, because some of the, the like stuff people be spraying in a house, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I have a little bit of questions about who's training it and why, right? Um, so that's just to give you a sense. Now, with generative AI, the way that I frame it is generative AI is trying to mimic the human imagination. It's trying to mimic our ability to generate what's new and what's next, whether that's visually, whether that's in conversation. We want it to be able to mimic the way that we think and we create how we interact with each other day to day. So how do you actually teach a machine how to think and act like a human? Well, there's the most popular field and the most popular way of doing that is with machine learning. Machine learning is where you teach a machine how to do something by giving it examples. Now, there are two ways once you've given it examples, like let's say I want to teach it how to identify a, this is computer vision specifically, but the, the, out, the analogy is uh, generally applied. So let's say I want to teach it how to know the difference between a strawberry and a kiwi, right? I'm going to give it a bunch of examples of a strawberry and a kiwi. Now, if I tell it in advance, I supervise it, and I say, hey, these are all the strawberries, these are all the kiwis. Now, figure out how to tell the difference between the two. That's one way I can do it. Or I could just give it a whole bunch of pictures of strawberries and kiwis and say, figure it out yourself, without telling it what's going on in advance. That's called unsupervised machine learning. Machine learning is by far the most popular way to build models to date in any way is either by supervised training, which is you already know the answer you want it to get to, so you give it specific examples of that answer. You keep examples that you test it on to see like, hey, is it telling the difference yet? Can it tell the difference between the two or no? Or you can do unsupervised where I give it like millions of images of strawberries and kiwis and then see how well it figures it out and then maybe fine tune it as we go along. So large language models are uh, essentially trained with a type of what we call unsupervised machine learning. There are different techniques. Some people use deep learning, which we'll talk about in a second. But essentially what you do is you take a large corpus of text. So if you hear people talking about ChatGPT or BARD and uh, you know, any of these other large language models and they're like, we've got 14.6 billion parameters, that's what they're talking about. That means that they've got a very large corpus of text data that they give to this, uh, specifically of conversation data, that they're giving to this algorithm to be able to learn how to predict what word should come next based on the words that came before? This is very important later when we talk about the ethics of these systems. Then what it does is it starts to practice. It'll generate a little bit. Hey, here's what I've got going on. I'm going to respond to you, talk to you based on your prompt. 
And then researchers or the developers will go back in and say, okay, this thing is generally good, it can have kind of a conversation, but now we're gonna take a more specific corpus of text data, so not just everybody's Reddit conversations, and we're going to train it to do a more specific task. That's called fine tuning. So that's kind of the process of creating a large language model. So deep learning, which is another technique I'm not gonna get into today because my brain is not wired for linear algebra right now, uh, deep learning is a technique in which you train the algorithm by mimicking the way that neurons in the human brain fire. So all that to say, now we're in this world where these algorithms are being built by folks and it's like chat GPT, barred everything, everywhere, all at once, right? You've got it passing medical exams, you've got, you know, teachers using it more than students, you've got it passing uh, licensing exams, you've got it, um, people are being bothered by it. So all this technology that's coming at us so fast I think one of the questions that we tend to forget is artificial intelligence a superhero or a supervillain? So let's take a look first at some of the ways that it's actually doing a lot of good before I freak you all out. <laughs> so one of the ways AI has been used for good, not necessarily just these kind of large language models, but just AI in general. In Uganda, there was an issue where they had, uh, a, 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 in Kampala in Uganda, there was an issue that they had with air pollution, where it would be so bad at some days that people shouldn't even go outside. But they had no way to monitor this or inform folks of what the current air quality was. As a result, they had millions of people each year dying or becoming seriously ill from respiratory infections that could have been prevented had they been warned about the air quality. So the University of Kampala came up with this really dope idea where, you know, um, out there they don't, they, they have like taxis, but they also have like the guys who ride on bikes to like deliver things throughout the city. So they linked up with all of them and said, hey, what if we put sensors that can measure the air quality on the back of all of your, your bikes? So as you rode around the city, that data would be sent up to an algorithm that would help us compute in real time the air quality across the city and we could issue warnings to our citizens. So they were able to do that, they built and deployed that. Um, you see examples of it being used in um, sustainability efforts like predicting uh, deforestation and the impacts of that, predicting things within the Amazon rainforest, the water levels, how to, how to move in that way. You can also see Google who also, wait, former employer here, but not to brag, <laughs> but they, they just had the flood forecasting system which went live all across India, then it spread out to Malaysia and I believe just a few weeks ago was released so that any region could predict when a flood is going to happen and react accordingly. You probably heard of all the medical examples of AI being able to detect diseases or issues inside of uh, images better than doctors actually could. So we see clear examples of AI being used for good. Matter of fact, AI and renewable energy alone is expected to go and surpass uh, almost $75 billion in the next uh, five, six years here. So we're coming up on a massive market for good that's not only important, it's also extremely profitable. But then we have to look at the reality of this technology, the side that some of us are afraid of, some of us don't wanna talk about, but that all of us are being affected by when AI turns into the supervillain. So uh, across the US and across the world, algorithms have been deployed without guardrails. Not that they were intended to go out harming people, but that maybe they were just shipped a little bit too fast. Maybe the right people weren't involved in developing it. Maybe the tests and protocols weren't actually set up to function in a way so that these algorithms didn't create harm. The first example is an algorithm that is in use right now in 11 states in the United States in the child welfare system. This algorithm is supposed to predict the likelihood that somebody, uh, that a child is in serious risk, meaning that they are about to die, and is a precursor for separating that child from their parents. Well, from 2015 to 2017, when this algorithm was in use in the state of Illinois, it flagged 4,100 children as being 90% likely to be severely harmed by their parents. Not a single one was. There was one instance where 369 children were flagged as 100% going to die. Not a single one of them was in danger, but every single one of those children was black or Latino. This algorithm and its failure over those course of those two years caused the state of Illinois to say, uh, we're not using AI for this, and they canceled their contract and their pilot. But again, 11 states in the United States today still use this algorithm in their, their DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, or their Child Protective Services uh, government entities. Another example, um, one that I like to pull up, uh, it's not just a data scientist who says this. There was an incident 
that happened in, I believe, 2020 with United Healthcare Group, where they deployed a healthcare algorithm that was supposed to uh, solve an issue that we like to call in computer science a resource allocation problem. You've got an infinite amount of sick people, you have a finite amount of specialists who can see them. So how do you best use the specialist time to treat the most sick people so that you can get the best out of their services and heal as many people as possible? Sounds altruistic, right? Well, unfortunately for the people who built this model, they decided that to determine how sick a person was, they would use how much that person had previously spent on that medical condition to make that decision. And if any of us have ever taken any sociology class, you know that access to healthcare, desire to go see healthcare practitioners varies based on economic level, geography, race, gender, ability level, there are tons of factors that will affect how much I can spend on a condition. So this algorithm that was turned on for 30 million people turned out to be biased in a way in which 100% of the time, it was recommending that healthier white patients see the specialist over sicker black patients. Um, the only way that this got found out, by the way, was when an external researcher got curious and proposed a research project that discovered it. Uh, I wonder how many more of these kinds of things are turned on that we don't know about. There was a, a, similarly in Michigan, there was an algorithm called MIDAS, which was intended to detect fraud within the unemployment system. Obviously, none of us want our social services and social resources abused, so if people shouldn't be claiming unemployment, they shouldn't be getting it. But this algorithm was terrible at what it did, and it flagged a bunch of folks who actually needed the, those services as wrongfully collecting it. And because the state was the one who set up and turned on the algorithm and decided that they were wrongfully collecting it, the state immediately turned around and started putting liens on people's wages to recoup that money that was false without one, ever notifying folks that it was an algorithm that had made that decision, and two, without giving them a chance to appeal that decision. So to this day, those citizens are still fighting the state of Michigan for money back. And what happened during this time was there were individuals individuals who became homeless because they were not able to pay their bills because of the lien that was on. There were folks who were arrested for failure to pay child support because the state was taking their money that they were using to pay child support. Now, I highly doubt that those algorithm developers who really just wanted to save money and make sure that the resources were being used properly were like, ooh, how can we get people arrested? Ooh, how can we make people be homeless? No, but because they created something that they did not properly test, they did not properly vet within the context it was going to be used, they harmed tons and tons of people in the state of Michigan. There were even reports of individuals committing suicide because of the strain that it put on their lives. Uh, so, another example, this is currently in use in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, looking at welfare detection and uh, fraud detection and looking at, hey, are people abusing their SNAP benefits? Well, the people who built this algorithm did not come from the DC, Maryland, or Virginia. It was researchers from a university out of state. And they had this genius idea that they could come up with a set of patterns that would obviously be fraudulent if somebody was doing them. Because in their reality, going to the grocery store more than three times a week constituted fraud. Because in their reality, they had a car. They would plan their trips out to the grocery store. But when you went into lower income neighborhoods in places like Baltimore, Maryland, where the grocery store was on the corner, where a parent might work multiple jobs, it was not uncommon for them to go to the grocery store three times in a day. Maybe their child wanted a snack or some food, so they'd give their kid the card and say, hey, go run and grab me some eggs. Oh, wait, we're out of chicken. Go grab me some chicken. All of that behavior ended up being flagged as fraud. But the catch is, it didn't flag it as fraud for the individuals who were using their SNAP benefits. It flagged it as fraud for the vendors who were accepting payments. So you're talking about your neighborhood bodega, your mom and pop liquor store that just happens to carry groceries because you live in a food desert too far away from an actual grocery store. So what this algorithm started doing was revoking these vendors' ability to accept EBT, punishing everybody in the community. And then the process was one never made aware to them. They were never told, hey, this is our new algorithm. These are the rules that you have to play by. So when their process was revoked, they also weren't told what documents they were supposed to keep for an appeal. And the kinds of documentation that they wanted, these store owners didn't have, like copies of every single receipt for every single SNAP transaction for a small liquor store in a food desert in a really low-income 
usually high crime neighborhood. And so these vendors, because they, the process was not made transparent to them, nor was the appeal process made accessible to them, they permanently lost their ability to receive SNAP benefits. Again, this algorithm is still on right now today throughout the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. And when we get into some of these newer algorithms, where we want to use chat GPT to solve everything. Maybe you saw that, that uh, news story about the lawyer who <laughs> just got in trouble in federal court because he used chat GPT to write his response and chat GPT made up a bunch of answers. There are also, and he's probably gonna get disbarred for it. There are also examples of chat GPT doing things that it probably shouldn't do. Like recommending to someone who was going, not just ChatGPT, large language models, who come in and are attempting to talk with it, saying, I don't feel good. And it says, oh, you don't feel good? Well, do you, how do you want to take care of that? You want to end your life? Because you probably should. Yeah, I agree with you. You should do it. And a man actually took his own life. Because again, these models are not generated to be sources of fact. They are not databases. Their job is to mimic human conversation, to take the words that you said and generate based on that, what it thinks is the response you want. What is the most likely response? So in that, it will make up sources. It will make up authoritative things. In the computer science field, we call this a hallucination. Matter of fact, when uh, my colleague, Timnit Gebru, wrote a paper called Stochastic Parrots and specifically warned of this danger in 2020 with large models, Google fired her. So these technologies, as much as they stand to make it easier for us to do things like diagnose serious conditions or understand our relationship with the environment and navigate them, they also stand to seriously harm us collectively if we are not intentional about how we build them and deploy them and hold people who create them accountable. It's not the same as me putting a piece of content on YouTube if we're turning it on to determine whether or not children should stay with their parents, whether or not people are abusing certain social systems, whether or not certain people do or do not get access to healthcare. Now the risk for these kinds of algorithms is very, very different than whether or not Amazon recommends the right product for me to buy. I actually don't wanna read that book, or no, I don't need another carafe for my bedroom. So we have to think about these risks incrementally. Which use cases do we want people to take more seriously? How do we want them to take more seriously? Do we want them to let us know? Because right now we're sort of in the wild, wild west of artificial intelligence. There is no requirement that you get notified that an AI made a decision. That means a bank right now, matter of fact, I know for a fact that a lot of these major banks use algorithms to determine whether or not you get a credit limit increase, whether or not you get approved for a loan. They don't have to tell you that they're using an AI to do that. There's no uh, appeal process that's mandated that requires that a human review it. So already some of our fundamental rights guaranteed to us in the US Constitution, or if you're not from the US, your EU fundamental rights are being challenged by these systems without proper testing. Again, there's no required testing. So this algorithm that's supposed to be able to tell me as a social worker whether or not a kid is about to die doesn't work. <laughs> and the way they figured that out was by testing it on real children in a real city who needed real help. There's no quality assurance requirements. So in the, um, in the aviation industry, for example, the reason why they're able to determine and figure out so quickly what the cause of an airline crash is is because they are required to document every single thing about that aircraft meticulously. From how tight the bolts are, to which part is where, to when that part was last serviced, so that within 48 to 72 hours of an airline crash, they are able to determine exactly what went wrong. There's no type of quality assurance requirements for these algorithms outside of the FDA, which is still kind of figuring out you know, does it use my Wi-Fi, if you saw those congressional hearings, to know how to do these things, right? And ultimately in the U.S., there is no federal U.S.-wide regulation. You've seen states individually, or even cities in some cases, make regulations about certain AI that they do and don't want used. The city of Berkeley, where my alma mater, UC Berkeley is, made the decision to ban facial recognition on police body cams. They still use body cams, but they don't let the body cams say, this is this person, because that technology was trash and resulted in a bunch of false arrests all around the United States. You've seen states like Colorado outright ban facial recognition in all their police departments. But overall, you've seen no comprehensive regulation. And all the companies who are building these algorithms, the biggest ones, keep saying, don't worry about it, we can do it ourselves. 
We'll regulate ourselves. Come on, let us make something that can create a pill just for you. We can figure it out on our own if it's harmful. Well, we see, obviously, that's not the case. So there are certain things you need to consider when building an algorithm, and it's not just how much money you can make or how much funds you can raise or how efficiently you can solve the problem. The first is the use case. Should we be using artificial intelligence for this? Should we be using artificial intelligence to determine whether or not a child needs to be separated from their home in the DCFS system? Should we be using artificial intelligence to try to figure out someone's sexuality based on a picture of their face? because researchers at Stanford have written multiple papers on how to do that. Should we use artificial intelligence to solve this problem, or is this something that a human needs to be involved in, or is this a hybrid solution that needs to be AI with extreme human oversight? The second is the quality of the data that you're getting. The individuals who built that fraud, the fraud detection system in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area got pulled data, if you excuse my French, they pulled that data out of their ass about what was considered fraud and not. There's no way that they spent one night in Baltimore, Maryland and went around asking people, how do you shop and how often do you go? Because one conversation with anyone in any of those food deserts would have told them that their entire process was wrong. So making sure that you're not only checking the quality of your data, that you're thinking about how to improve your data over time so that it's scalable. And scalable not in terms of the size of the technical infrastructure, but scalable across different cultures and across different geographies. If you want an algorithm to be something that is as globally as scalable as like a social media platform, you have to think about the local and cultural context that it will be used in. So maybe that algorithm would have worked for the neighborhood that they were in with their university, but it certainly didn't work for the hood in Baltimore, Maryland. And so you have to think about how to make it scalable across environments and for people who are not like you. It's very easy to build something well that works for someone who is like you. You have to be intentional about building it for someone who is not. And across that process, you need to be testing. At every, at every step of the, the development process for an algorithm, you need to be testing. Do our assumptions work? Should we still really use AI for this? Is our data good? Is this harming people? Is it not? How can we make sure it's not harming people who aren't like us? When it goes out into market, is it working? How do we need to adjust it maybe in this region or this market versus this region or market? And these need to be principles that are not some ethical thing you choose to adopt, but they become embedded in the way that you choose to build, deploy, and develop your algorithms uh, every day. So now we have this question. Is artificial intelligence a superhero or a supervillain? And the answer is, what are we going to choose it to be? This technology is already here. It's already helping people, and it's already hurting people. We're at a very pivotal moment in society where we have a choice to decide how we want to shape this. We can either be victims of the way this technology is imposed on us, or we can be shapers of the way that it gets used. Take action. When you're building in your own companies and in your own communities, slow down so that you move fast enough to move forward. And as often and as much as possible, get involved in the conversations that are happening at a local level, a state level, and a federal level about how this technology should and should not be used. Because I can't be the only one in there yelling at Mayor Bass to make stuff happen, all right? Thank you for your time.